All right, so hot takes. Is that what we're going to do? Yeah, I'm trying to find <coughs> trying to find the hot takes right now. Let's see. I'm not going to bother streaming it. Uh, there's a solid 450 right now. Um, because I don't want people to like see one and be like, "Oh, do that one," because I, I want to pick. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I don't want to like do super long ones. Like, here's what I'm gonna yeah. throw out: Kyrie peaked in KH1. You got to do more than that for me. You know, like I'm just gonna throw it out right now. Can I disagree? <laughs> you can disagree, but you got to, like, I, I mean, agree or disagree. Oh. The take is not good because it's not. I don't. I wouldn't say it's hot, and I would say that you didn't justify it at all. Like that's all it is. Like that was the whole take. Right. You know, so that's getting thrown out. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem too hot. It feels like that's a. It seems like that's a relatively common take. Yeah. So let me go into edit mode, and maybe we can just kind of start working on this <laughs> alive. Kyrie did. Kyrie did peak in cage too. You think so? Yeah. Um. I don't know. I haven't thought too deeply about it. I, I can't really give my opinion on it because I really don't know. I like Kyrie with the keyblade, just going right into action just yeah that's pretty good going for it you know i just think she's more fun as a like a character in one though she is more fun as a character in one um, but i don't know i think she's i think she's like i think she's cool in in cage too you know? yeah sure i i agree with she, that she's, she's got like the cool vibes yeah that's you know? the coolest she's ever been is too yeah. She seems a lot younger in three, like less mature, she does. you know. Um, well, the haircut and the yeah. voice seems a little higher, and uh, yeah, yeah. Man. yeah, whatever. Uh, limit PF, you thank you for the follow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How the fuck do I edit this? Uh, I was doing it before. Uh, script editor, that's not it. Accepting responses, I'm still accepting responses. Do you have this up? I can just uh, send it to you on Discord. <clears throat> yeah, do that. Okay. Look at me on Discord. Here I'm learning. Go. Yeah, so, yeah. And uh, Kiwi's uh, Discord icon is Peter Pan's health bar from uh, KH1. Oh, it's so good. They're also good. We were talking about that earlier. The uh, KH1 health bars. <clears throat> should, yeah. should this be a just chatting now, Gavaka? Do you think, or any other mods, or anyone who knows anything? Um, go right, first person and just stare at Goofy. Sure. Here we go. I'm in oh. there. I'm in there. I'm in there. Okay. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah, okay, I'll just do just chatting now. One sec. Um, ba -ba -ba -da -da. Change my category. This is going to be like four VODs anyway. Whatever. <laughs> um, okay. Do you see like an edit button? Because I, I sent this to you as an editor, did I not? think so but like i i don't have enough uh i don't have enough mental capacity right now to go and find the original thing that you sent me that's fair and it feels a little complicated right now yeah I i'm agree. just gonna i can computer too so yeah do that so Why? do that like i just want a thing that lets me delete takes that are not gonna make it um hmm Am I on the wrong link somehow? Like, what? Well, I'm going to close it. I'm going to close it right now. I don't think we need any more than 450. I think we're good. So let's say no more hot takes. We did it. No more hot takes. It's over now. Um, it's over. Except I can't find a button for that either. Well, I'm clearly bad at computering. Um, all right, let me let me do this. I'm just gonna go right to my Google Forms itself. Do you want to read any that you're that you're looking at? I'm just looking at the one about Kingdom Hearts 2 has the worst plotline and it uh, it brings up an interesting thing like Why would the organization want to make Sora an enemy if they kind of need him to keep beating the heartless? Like, yeah, you would why, think they would just leave why him alone. Why they just let him go? Yeah, yeah, like why even make themselves known to him? Right. That's a good take. Which is what they did in KH1, because they were oh. all alive during that time. That is and apparently... they kind of just let him do everything that he wanted, you know? That is apparently... And why uh... did they try to kill him? 
why does Z Z uh, Zaldin try to kill him in Beast Castle? Like, wouldn't that... I know it could be just, like, testing him, but, like, what if he actually killed him? Then <laughs> right. what was the plan, you know? Yeah. Was it worth sacrificing yourself just to test him? You would think not. Yeah. Um, that is Mig Masterin's take uh, in the chat with us here. Um, KH2's plotline. Like, I I have my grievances with KH2's plot, but that's that's what I don't hear very often, so I, I like that. I like the direction of that already. And why uh, and why does Saik sell him the plan? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It, right. it, you're, you're best off just not telling him anything. Um, well, I think one thing, and I don't know if the person says it, I'm trying not to look too far into it, yeah. just so I could see them all, the ones that we like all at once, but... Um, why... Uh, he tells him the plan, like, it, I think it's because he tells him the plan that's the dumb part of that, right? Because mm. if it was Axel, it would make more sense. Because Axel doesn't right, care he's about rogue. the organization yeah. at that yeah. point, you know? They could have just changed like, it to be someone else telling him so that Sora understands the quandary that he's in from someone that is not benefiting from him being in it, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, right, so if Axel told him, because Axel has reason to kind of uh, lead Sora down that path, Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, alright, well, I, I haven't f been able to figure out how I, I edit this, even though I've done it before. I feel like a big dumb idiot, but let's read some other ones. Um, let's see... Days is the best side game in the series. People just dislike it because the movie version was poorly made and the DS version hasn't been re-released. Wait, what um, was that? Days is the best side game in the series. People just dislike it because the movie version was poorly made and the DS version hasn't been released. Hmm. Um. Not I don't the worst. know. I, I'm just not. Uh, you know, it's not. It's not super uh, new to me. You know. Yeah, I don't know how hot it is, but I think yeah. it is a pretty good take. Yeah. That, like people discount it because it got the coded treatment, even though it's it's better than that. Yeah. Um, the next KH game should ditch space travel and have the characters move through portals or something. It feels weird going through an on-rail shooter in the middle of an action RPG. Maybe they could make it similar to that beginning segment in Nier Automata, but for the most part, um, I just... Uh, I don't know what the sentence is. Um, I just... Oh, I just want to hit Heartless with the funny Keyblade. I, I don't know if there's a hot take, but I don't see it talked about. Um, I... Yeah, I don't know... Like well, I don't know, I don't know what the stakes are in this take. You know what I mean? Like it's uh, I'm I'm not saying it's hot or cold. Um, I think I agree more so like less for the gameplay function and more for the story function. Like I think um the direction that we're moving in with like the quadratum angle, um it makes less sense to contextualize everything through space travel. Like I don't really anticipate that there will be gummy stuff in four. Um, just based off of what we have, like, I, I could be jumping the gun on that, but I don't know if, uh, if it really makes sense. Like, if Sora is in Quadratum for most of the game, I don't anticipate he'll be, like, piloting a gummy ship. Maybe you're playing as a Riku or a Kairi in the Realm of Light and you're doing that as them. That would make sense, right. but I don't know how Sora accesses, you know, if they go the route of he's gonna go to, like... Um, alternates, you know, live-action property versions of the worlds he's already been to. It wouldn't really make sense to do that through space travel, so... Um, Why would there be different worlds anyway in that in, like, the, the fictional world and the quadratum I, half of things? Like, why would they be separated, right? Yeah, I don't like, know. What's the contextualization for that? Oh, yeah, I haven't found the contextualization yet. I'm just thinking about it from, like, a like a brand or marketing perspective and that right that's it makes sense that they would want to explore those properties i don't know how they contextualize it i'm sure they, they could figure out a way to do it but i i don't know it yet oh uh, um, yeah i'm not even yeah right i'm not even debating it. i'm mostly just asking like out of curiosity yeah <laughs> like i wonder what they're going to uh to say to justify like why everything's not like a part of the same landmass like uh yeah like as it used to be in the the, the regular kingdom lords worlds you know right right because they're those you know we know those worlds are only separated because of like a thing that happened right yeah I, you know, they're gonna have to do a lot of parts so like yeah they're gonna have to do a lot of groundwork explain that for another yes right 
yeah. Um, all right, let me uh, let me skip around here. Let me find some other ones. I think I, I read a couple of these on a stream once. So um, let's see. Let's just like jump to like number twenty. Bum, bum, ba, dum, bum. Um, replaying Cage Two and BBS after three. I'm not seeing Zigbar slash Brig as Lushu, especially in BBS. Brig is characterized as a cocky, brash mercenary, so revealing him to actually be a much older and capable being with plans of his own doesn't gel quite right with me. Maybe if his only appearances were two days in Dream Drop before three, I'd have an easier time buying the reveal. Um, yeah, I mean, I I get that, and it's something that I've, I've seen fairly often, like, how am I supposed to buy that Brake has been Lushu this whole time when, like, their personalities are so different? But at the same time, I think, the, I mean, I've, I've been saying this on the record for forever, basically, but, like, Lushu is the way that he, or rather, Brake is the way that he is because he's so similar to the Master of Masters, at least if you ask me. I think their personalities yeah. are so similar. I think Brake kind of ad adopted the personality of the Master of Masters um, along the way, um, and that's that's what the Brake uh, personality is. Um, so I don't hate that. That was Sea Keg the Punslinger, who is uh, usually with us on Twitch. Um, it's not very hot, though. Like I feel like a lot of people are saying that. Like They don't buy Brake as as Lushu. And yeah. I and I feel like there's like I just explained it in my own way, but I, I feel like there's there is like a bit of a bit of a considerable pushback to that. That doesn't yeah. keep it super interesting to me. Yeah, it's one that as of now I think requires some <coughs> canon, you know? Yeah. Like to make that work. Uh especially the birth by sleep part of it. I mean I agree that it would be easier to believe if that was not a part of it. Yeah. Because he seems more like a genuine doofus in that game. The other ones, he seems like he knows the most, but he's playing dumb. That one, he seems a little... At least when he first appears in, in Radiant Garden. Towards the end, it feels like he has more insight. Yeah. But but right at his first appearance, he's really selling it, let's just say. You know? Yeah, for sure. I don't um, think they had it in <clears throat> mind in 2010. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I also want to like reestablish that the uh oh wait i have a poll up who did a, oh oh okay i'm not seeing zigbar as lushu good take or bad take so if you want to vote on that you can like here's the thing there are gonna be plenty of good takes in here that are not hot you know what i mean like i, I feel like some people are having trouble like they're conflating the two things like yes. we're not like I, I think ideally it'd be it'd be nice if the take was good i think it like it has to be a good take in order to get in at all but it also has to be hot it has to be something that you don't hear a bunch and I hear a bunch of uh, Zigbar as Lucia doesn't make sense. Like, that's not new to me. It's not new enough for me to consider it a hot take. Um, so that's kind of like my, my qualifiers there. Um, all right. I have right. something from Cartoon Buffoon. I'm not sure if Buffoon is still here. But this is about Arendel. It's a long one, so I'm going to try to like get bullet points here. Arendel is a well-designed world, one of the best in Cage 3. No other world in the game consistently demands that you engage with its layout in an interesting way. Um, while each, while every room may be aesthetically similar and you may not know them by name, the gameplay moments each one creates are incredibly distinct. Air stepping or running up different levels of the mountain to quickly ascend, running across a large wall to try and avoid grounded enemies, launching up wind paths to progress faster, pushing against a storm to reach the kingdom, not to mention adapting certain iconic parts of the mountain like the frozen lake with the trees that look like teardrops and the frozen over stabby icicles. None of this has even started to cover the Ice Labyrinth, which is effectively a more creative and engaging, ver engaging version of Elsa's Palace with its own slew of standout rooms. Let's be real, the Ice Palace in the movie is really just two big empty rooms. It wouldn't have been that cool to explore. Most other worlds in the game will only ask you to creatively traverse the world all or all of one or two times, but Arendel is always throwing something new and interesting at you. I will even justify Frozen Slider and Finding Olaf. That first escape from the Frost Serpents is very cool and intense, and while his voice, <coughs> voice may be grating, the Olaf scavenger hunt is a fun bit of forced exploration, which I feel only adds to the overall world experience. Finally, my favorite little idea in the whole world, taking a boss you just fought within the world and making that boss a party member that totally wrecks shop. Such a cool victory for the player as this boss uses moves they just use to murder your ass to murder your enemies. I feel like I'm going to get off topic if I keep going, so I'll just end by saying Let It Go is a banger. Um... I kind of really like this, actually. Like, uh, yeah, Car this is good. Cartoon Buffoon is uh, really selling me on Arendelle things, and I, I don't think um, I don't think I've ever disagreed with any of this. I guess I've just always weighed the parts of it I don't like heavier than the parts of it that are pretty legitimately good, um, because, and especially in the beginning when we're talking about how we have to engage with the level design. Um, 
I don't know if I would say that no other world forces you to engage in that way, but like, and 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 Buffoon concedes to the points I've always made is that like these rooms are not visually memorable. You don't like know what like where they are and how like they're not like visually distinct. Um, but it is true that like there is like that whole portion with like the air stepping on like the like the stalactite things. Um, you know, like running up the walls in the mountains, um, the wind gust portion. Um, but like, and I, I agree with all of this. I, it's just there's so much other stuff working against it for me personally that um, I would still have Arendelle very low when I get to that inevitable video. But like, this is all true stuff. Like, I don't know if I'm really disagreeing with anything being said here. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've kind of felt this way, you know, for. A while, I've kind of been on the defense of, of Arendelle for yeah. quite some time. I feel like I always kind of enjoyed first just that it was a snow setting, and yeah, I like when they mix up what kind of settings are available. I mean, the closest we got to this was like the mountains and land of dragons and right. stuff like that. So you know, have a whole world that kind of fit that aesthetic was uh, was kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as you know what they're bringing up about you know it's it's unique mechanically mm -hmm. uh that's that's pretty interesting uh, it does give you a lot to play with uh like you said i don't know if it goes beyond any of the other worlds i mean it just happens to have like it's specific non-combat elements just right. like the other ones do right like the caribbean probably asks more of you right yeah to do there's a, a lot i mean more, you have the underwater right? yeah the underwater combat the ship combat um you know you have your your typical land-based portions uh and right. I, I guess the thing with me is with, with, with arendelle is that the parts are greater than the whole you know like i i think if you look at each portion of it individually um it's it's pretty nice but when you're like contextualizing it as like your journey throughout that world from point a to b like that's where it starts to get grading and where it starts to wear on me um, and when it, when it blends together and it's not distinct, like that to me is a failing of the of the. And maybe it's just a me personally seeing it that way. Like that's entirely possible. In fact, it's probable. Yeah. But um, I can't say that it's. I can't say it's a well-designed world, but I can say that like there are individual well-designed portions of it. But this is like I, I think this is an early contender to to be in the bracket. You know, like I think this is pretty good because oh, sure. you don't hear anybody yeah. saying stuff like this, and it is all very well argumented. And it doesn't. It's not crazy. It's not made in bad faith. Like I, I can tell that Buffoon believes this. You know, um, right? Yeah. So I, I, I like that. We'll have to uh, kind of put a pin in that one. Um, and you know, again, when we're talking about the world, like there's the world on a design level, and then there's a world in like the thematic and contextualizing it with the rest of the game level, where I think it falters. You know, I don't think it's, you know, it's it's doing the movie plot itis to the max more than any other world in the history of the series. So like that and is badly. yeah and, and badly, badly right so that is like a huge knock against it for me but if we're talking about it purely on a gameplay level um, looking at the individual set pieces I, I think there's definitely something to that there so good job buffoon let's move on let's look at some other ones here um, certainly not a buffoonish take yeah not very buffoony yes not um, living up to your name there cartoon buffoon I really should not have given people 500 character 500 words on these though <laughs> I'm just looking at all of this. Uh, all right, we got one from Elvin Prince 358 Cage 2 FM post game content is subpar. I've never heard this before, so we're already off to a hot start here. The Cavern of Remembrance, Sephiroth, certain Data Org fights, and the Lingering Will are great, but the Mushroom 13, the Coliseum, the fights like Data Vex Endemic, Luxor Zexion are too reliant on annoying gimmicks to be fun. In 1FM and 3, the Coliseum Cup slash Battle Portals and Secret Bosses exist as a test of your skills learned throughout the main campaign. The skills required for the majority of the 2FM post-game are almost all responses to new gimmicks, where several encounters such as Data Demix's 99 Water Clones rely on such specific strategies that it feels like the only way to get through it is by cheesing it. And the gimmicks in the Coliseum, such as the point counters or timers, are just annoying and ruin what could have been a fun challenge. Even in BBS, the Mirage Arena is quite enjoyable, although the secret bosses vary in quality to say the least. As is in most cases, KH1 is still undefeated. Um, it's definitely hot, right? Yes, um, I've never yeah. heard anyone. I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say. Um, <laughs> it's definitely hot. But, see, uh... the 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 issue I take is that like it starts off with like okay, post game content subpar. Cavern of Remembrance, Sephiroth, certain data org fights, and Lingering Will are great. That's like a lot of stuff, you know. Like that's You're a lot right. of stuff that's great. 
Um, I think when you say Cage 2 post-game content, really nobody's thinking about Mushroom 13, the Coliseum, and a handful of data fights, you know? And, like, as right. someone who likes 2 the least out of the main 3, I do think it has the strongest post-game. Um, like, 1 is next. I think 3's is pretty abysmal before Remind. Um, yeah. 3's is literally Dark Inferno and the Battle Gates. Um, yeah. So... And I, I mean, it, it's hot, but, like, I don't know if I buy it, you know? Uh, and right. do we need to buy it for it to be in the bracket? That's kind of what we have to figure out here. Like, it, it doesn't uh, feel as well argued um, as the, as Cartoon Buffoons. Um, a lot of it seems like, oh, well, I don't like these gimmicks. Which I agree, like, there are definitely, like, a lot of data fights that are just, like, here's this new gimmick to deal with. But, like, if we're if we're going to use that to lambast the entire post-game of 2FM, like, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Hmm. I mean, how many are those of those fights really are gimmicky, though? Right? Like... I mean, Data, I Data Vexen like has... Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of go through it, at least to the best of my ability. Vexen has, like, the anti-Sora clone function. Demix has the water clones. Luxord, you know, his... You know the time meter, I guess, is what you can consider the gimmick there. Zexion has the book dimension. Um, I mean, okay, but like, I mean, where's the line from like gimmick to just right. like something to make each of them a unique <coughs> fight? Yeah, and right? I, ta I talk about that in the Cage 2 boss ranking video where it's like there are gimmicks that are built into the game, like the conventions of the game itself. And then there are gimmicks that are like like the Trick Master in KH1. The gimmick of the Trick Master is that it's so tall, you cannot reliably combo it without using the environment. You know what I mean? But it's not like the game changed the rules to make that to make that a thing. You know what I mean? Whereas like right. with a lot of KH2 fights, not just the data ones, you look at something like, you know, P2 or like, um, uh, what's another one? Um, like the beast fight, I guess. I know it's, it's like a small one. I, I'm having trouble thinking, but um, like they're adding a bar or a mechanism that does not usually exist outside of that specific fight. Um, whereas like the trick master, an enemy being tall is not like changing the fundamentals or like adding something to your UI to make it a gimmick. Um, I guess that's kind uh, of my thought on it. Yeah, and there's value know, to both. I mean, maybe. You know, maybe the Vexen one, but like I don't know, the the Zexion one kind of feels like it's playing by the same rules, right? Like most mm -hmm. of it, though it's changing the aesthetics, like it really is mostly based around like the reaction commands and and stuff like that, and so is the Luxord fight, and I mean yeah. those are things that are introduced very early on. No, yeah. like they're not, oh, yeah, you know, pulling the triangle button out of their ass, like, you know, in the post game. Like, it is a mechanic that's kind of used. Now, how, like, well it's integrated into the fights is, you know, maybe another yeah. question. But, like, are the, are those gimmicks or, again, are they kind of, like, something to, the, uh, like, distinguish the <clears throat> fights, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think the Luxord, like, the time meter is a gimmick, right? Like, I have to consider yeah. that a gimmick because you're, like, literally yes. changing how the UI works. Um, right. Like, something right. like the the second Grim Reaper fight, like, that's a gimmick because of the, the gold medallions. Um, yeah. I consider something, like, the Roxas fight against, uh, like, Roxas versus Sora in the World of Never Was, like, I don't think there's a single gimmick in that fight, you know? Like, if you're going to say, like, oh, you can steal his Keyblade. Like, that's just, like, a reaction command, you know? Like, there's nothing to that. Um, yeah. And, I, and again, I don't think I don't think a boss is bad because it has those built-in gimmicks. Um, I talk about that in that KH2 boss ranking video. But, like, there are certain things that, like, they add in to spice things up. And other times, like, in, in KH1, it's really just environmental or how the boss itself is, is structured that, it, that you might consider a gimmick. Like, the Cave of Wonders Guardian. Um, like, you consider that a gimmick because it's, like... It's, like, not really, like, it's mostly, like, a mob fight, and then there's, like, these two different targets that are, like, separately uh, responsible for for causing the mobs to spawn. Like, there's, like, an angle there to consider that a gimmick fight, but um, yeah. 2 definitely leans into it much more. Yeah, I mean, so at the end of the day, with this with this uh, KH2 postgame one, like, I, I just feel like it's, the argument is not off to a great start when it, like, lists out everything that everyone thinks of when they hear a KH2 postgame and calls it great, and then kind of, like, lumps in... Like, the Coliseum is technically not even really post-game, you know? You don't have to, uh... Yeah. Like, that's always available to you. Um, at least I think most of it is. Maybe not, like, Hades Paradox. I don't really remember the criteria there, but... Um, you know, this is, like, a maybe for me. I don't, I don't anticipate it's gonna make it, but I, I do appreciate the effort from Elven Prince there. 
Um, let's see. <clears throat> Alright, we want to try to get ones that aren't, like, super long to read. Um, right. Obviously, when we pick out our... I think this is going to have to be, like, a 32 one, right? Like, this cannot be 64. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is 32 or, you know. Yeah. yeah. The elite of the elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, God, Frosty wrote something on each game? Oh, no. Frosty wrote about Recoded. All right. Do you want to do the Frosty Recoded one? <laughs> do you want to hear about Recoded? Again. This <laughs> again. Let's see. Let's do it. I might not add much, but go. Okay. Recoded is the game that is... Okay, this is, this is different from saying Recoded is a really, really good game. This is different already. Recoded is the game that is best suited for its handheld console. That's interesting already. Mm, I'm not yeah. sure if I agree already, because I think Days is, is up there already for that, but... Um, when one thinks about the handheld Kingdom Hearts, you've got your comms, your BBSs, your 3Ds, your dazes, and your recoded. Recoded did the most with the console it appeared on. Chain of Memories is a beautiful game that set the stage for the organization, but it was marred by difficult to read card numbers if you weren't on a blacklit screen and a wildly different yet same combat style. Okay, Days had so far. Okay, Back so far. Days had a huge impact on the Kingdom Hearts story, but it suffers as it is wholly a 3D action game without an extra thumbstick. Levels and areas become repetitive over the course of several missions. Okay, yeah, on a gameplay level, I would agree with that take on Days. Um, on a story level, I think Days is very well suited to be a handheld mobile sort of experience because of, like, the day structure, or the mission structure, you know? It's designed yeah, for, yeah. like, you know, short bursts of play. Um, right. But Frosty's tackling it more so from the gameplay side there. But I think it looks yep. like she will be for most of this. Similarly, BBS, for all of its hard-hitting story beats and influence on the series, with a PS was a PS2 game, but small. BBS limits your areas to small rooms with minimal characters, giving you little to interact with. Um, I don't know. I think there's more to interact with in BBS than there is in Cage 2. You know what I mean? The, I mean, if you're going to mm. say that it gives you small rooms, I, I, think, I think that's kind of cherry-picky, but... There is more to interact with, but like I don't know if any of the the best interactions like are because of the <coughs> PSP. You know, like none yeah. of it's due to the system that it's on. So as it relates to what they're going for here, like I don't know. Yeah, the BBS, it, the BBS part might be a stretch. I mean, I, I agree with the days and the the comp stuff so far. Yeah. Um, 3D has an absolutely broken flow motion system. Gets big points with me, and hides your abilities behind gotta catch them all Nintendogs. The only advantage it took of the 3DS was for reality shifts and petting your giant purple T-Rex. Um, Which are both bad mechanics in my yeah, opinion that no, I, I don't really add much, so. Yeah, I know Kino's not going to like that, but I I tend to agree uh, with that. I mean, the thing, with, well, and you could say like three, DD, uh, DDD takes advantage of like the street pass thing a little bit. There's, there's a street pass functionality. Um, but, I mean, let's get to the Recoded of it all, though, because that's that's what we're here to talk about. Um, but Recoded started its life as a humble phone game that somehow ended up as the most suited game for its console. Think about what the DS was as a console. It was a continuation of the Game Boy line meant for short play sessions. For example, one might bring the DS on the train or bus to school. Its clamshell design made it easy to transport without harming the screen, so it was an incredibly or an inherently carryable console. Recoded consists of short missions similar to Days. However, for each world you visit, the game offers unique playstyle changes that complement the more familiar large room with enemies. Side scrollers in Traverse Town, rail shooters in Wonderland, and a Final Fantasy combat style in Olympus keep the content engaging and fresh in bite-sized portions for easily achievable goals. Um, tying it all together is the stat matrix. As you make progress in the game, you unlock new abilities and customizations for Sora. The game makes heart. Uh, the game makes the game makes handy use of the dual screens to show the matrix on bottom and how it affects your stats on top. Additionally, the stat matrix also lends itself to these short periods of play. When you complete a challenge to unlock new stat matrix abilities, you feel a sense of accomplishment that your short playtime meant something and that you have more to look forward to the next time you play. Recoded is not the best Kingdom Hearts game, nor is it the best story game. Much of its story is largely inconsequential, but where it lacks in story content, it shines in gameplay, using the DS to its fullest extent, building out what Days laid down before, and thereby surpassing it as the Kingdom Hearts game best suited for the console it appears on. What do you think about that? Uh... Well... <laughs> I think, uh, I think I actually agree with the take, but yeah. for like a, a, a different reason. I mean, I agree with bits and pieces of, mm -hmm. of that, yeah. actually. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I think though my main point for this would be like, Coded deserves the system that it appears on and the other ones don't. 
I mean, especially <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dream Drop Distance and Birth by Sleep, they are, are console games that just were kind of pointlessly put on to uh, handheld systems that it doesn't really matter. Or, I mean, there's no reason why <laughs> that should be the case other than, you know, something corporate. I mean, but if you're trying to maximize the potential of the, the systems that the games are using, yeah. then there'd be no reason why you but, put them on handheld handheld systems. Can I say that, like, I think it's kind of an easy W. It's not as big of a W as some people might think after I read all of it. Like, and I, I think I agree with it, but I'm just saying, like, you're saying Coded is, is best designed for, for the DS. Like, the it's, it's actually, it's surpassing as the, the Kingdom Hearts game best suited for the console that it appears on. Well, like, I think by the nature of the DS being, like, a handheld game with two screens, like, it's already inherently more gimmicky and more open to, like, certain sorts of, like, gameplay changes than something like oh, a PS2 right. game. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like... Well, that too, yeah. Is Cage 3 <laughs> not the best suited for the Xbox One slash PlayStation 4 because it doesn't have, it's like, the, what's, what's the gimmick to the PS4 or the, or the Xbox One? Like, there isn't one, you know? It's just, like, sure, your standard sure. home console. So it's, like... Right. When, you, when your system inherently already has more opportunities to have gimmicks and have, like, a game that's more suited for that specific console, then the W is not as, as big as it might appear. Like, I think there's a lot to this. I think I'm kind of, like, up against it, against Days for, th like, that title still. Like, I still think the mission structure of Days, um, it kind of might, uh, you know, surpass Coded in that particular um, facet. But, like, right. like, I think it's a good take. I've never heard it before, you know? So it's definitely a hot take. Um, yeah. But I just don't know if it's, like, as consequential as it might appear initially. Um, so I, I would put it on the short list for making it out of the bracket, though, so far. Uh, Vig says that Coda <coughs> is humble. The others are aiming too high. That's my take, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that, like, Coded is the worst, so it deserved the... <laughs> the uh the console release the least the other ones are more right. ambitious and so they would have translated better to to something that was bigger than the size of the phone screen basically yeah uh that's essentially my take so but i agree with i mean some of the things that the the writer there yeah came up with as well i i tend to be in your boat too that days works pretty well as a handheld game the yeah. like quick spurts of playing gets a very like on the go type of experience in my opinion it's not one where i feel like you really spend two hours at a time playing even if you're not uh playing it like on the go like it it, it feels like you know you get your 20 minutes in and you move on for the day you know yeah it's spread out over some time so I don't know exactly how it relates these days now that the DS is like old school. Uh, it's hard for me to go like into that mindset, but those are just some of my, my general thoughts there. Yeah. No, I, I think it's on the short list for the bracket. You know, I think uh, I think it definitely so far. I mean, we obviously there's 450 of them. We haven't looked at them all, but um, <coughs> uh, I think there's definitely room for it so far. In closing. <laughs> Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop, and nothing is added by having them on the systems that they are. I mean, at least a little something might be added to to coded. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say nothing, is. but I would say it's it's not okay, enough to. Very yeah. little that's interesting about those games is added. I, I mean, agree. I agree. Like, yeah, like the best parts of those games are actually like challenged by the systems that they're on. Yeah. Like watching like this incredibly important story stuff in Birth by Sleep get <laughs> relegated to the to the phone screen size PSP uh, screen is like a little unfortunate. Yeah. And yeah. then things like flow motion that's so bombastic and everything, and you're gonna put that on like a super small screen. I mean, that feels like really out of place. Hit the jabib. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's actually a dab right there. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you might oh, have missed sorry. it. Sorry, I, I really don't know the difference. Well, here's I'm, I'm um, it's gonna be like ten seconds for you, but I'm I'm doing a Jabib right now. This is the Jabib okay. pose. Um, it's like one arm curved over your head and then one arm curved under your chin. That's the Jabib. Okay. But that's what he's doing in Trower's Town. Little yellow ball guy. Um, gotcha. All right. Oh, I see it. I see it now. All right. Carly has a take here, all about Monstro, uh -oh. fittingly, and we're in Monstro, so. 
All right. Here comes Carly. All right. Okay. My spiciest take about Cage is that Monstro is the best Disney world in the entire series. First off, I love Ooh. the world design. I know all the naysayers will say that it is this, is very the same with all the different chambers, but I feel like utilization of the layers in each room help make each one distinct. Also, what other world uses a heart list to determine where you need to go? Did you know about that, Kiwi? Did you know that uh, the what? green the green requiems in Monstro they lure you deeper into uh, into the the chambers, like um. Mm. They they spawn above the room that leads to progress. So if you talk to you talk to Geppetto enough times, Geppetto will say, "Beware the green monsters! They'll lure you deeper into Monstro," which means that every chamber that leads towards Parasite Cage One has green requiem spawn above them. So that's actually like a very secretive uh, progression hint um, to give context uh, to what side, I was saying. There. Side question: Why <coughs> does Geppetto know that? Uh, How I guess does he know that. I guess he's tried going into the chambers himself, and he realized that the the ones with the green records above them lured him deeper in. I don't know, but uh, interesting. Yeah. I'd like a side game about that. But anyway, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, so what other world uses the Heartless to help determine where you need to go? Uh, none that I can think of, and that's so sick. <laughs> Besides the chambers, I feel like <laughs> the mouth, stomach, and throat are all designed very well. Those rooms are very interesting and have a lot of great detail when it comes to how they're designed. They walk the line of being realistic, but also fun and playful. As for the story, it's very charming with the introduction to the world where Donald and Goofy are getting items thrown at them, the joke about it being heavy showers. Come on, that's so good. I also think having characters from Jiminy's world appear here help provide a new perspective on Jiminy as a character. I think we can all agree yep. Jiminy sucks, but also knowing more about your journal keeper gives him more dimension. I appreciate that in the way of character development for both Pinocchio, Jiminy, and the party. And now for the juicy stuff, you fight alongside Riku. When in the series are you fighting alongside someone who you're beefing with? Having him in the first Parasite Cage battle, uh, uh, first Parasite Cage boss battle has so many implications. Even though Riku and Sora have very different reasons for fighting the Parasite Cage, Riku wants Pinocchio's heart for Kairi, and Sora wants to save Pinocchio from Riku, they still have the same goal in mind in, it, in, in getting it out of here. Uh, this is such a parallel to the overall arc of the story, where Riku and Sora both have the same goal, but are choosing very diff differing routes to get there, dark versus light. I don't see any other Disney worlds have this much of a connection to the overall... I don't often see other Disney worlds have this much of a connection to the overall story of Kingdom Hearts. I don't necessarily think Monstro accomplishes every aspect perfectly, but all of the points mentioned work together to make it the best Disney world in the series, in my opinion. Also, honorable mentions, Very Small Wish and Monstro's Monstro are bangers, and no one can deny that. Also, Little Fish Cleo, it's cool. You get the first group ability high jump, which leads to further exploration of previous worlds and make future worlds easier to navigate. Also, after the completion of the world, you get new house in Traverse Town for Geppetto and Pinocchio, which adds to the lore of that world. Monstro is just all around charming and cool. Please don't trash my take too much. Please, thanks. <laughs> What's up, Carl? <laughs> there you go. Um, she did a great job. She did a great job. Yeah, it was very uh, good. Um, listen, I've always been on the Monstro train. You know, I've always thought that it was really good. Um, these are all good points here. Um, you know, if you look at my KH1 world ranking, I make a lot of similar points in that, especially about the story side of things. Um, I can't call it the best ever, you know what I mean? Like, I can definitely, um, maybe even raise it a spot or two higher than it is on my list. Like, you know, maybe retroactively I might have it above, like, an Agrabah. Um, but it, it definitely is better than everyone gives it credit for, you know? Um, I can't say it's the best, though. Like, I, I can't go that far, but it's, it's very good, I think. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think as far as, like, how it integrates into the larger story, I mean, it's certainly top five in the whole series, Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, I did the, uh, the other video essay on how Disney integrates its world oh, into the yeah, Kingdom yeah, Hearts, yeah. and this was top four. I mean, I probably have it number two, to be honest. I think I have what Space Paranoids. What other... Space Paranoids number one, I would say. That's, like, the runaway winner there. And then yeah. I think it's, like battle for second third and fourth with monstro cage one neverland and actually monstropolis in cage three so mm, interesting okay i i agree with uh I, I would have to think about monstropolis a little deeper i mean i know why you like it right negative and, emotions yeah and, and maybe uh, maybe that's weighing it too heavily but um if it's not going to be in that top tier it would be like the bridge between that tier and the one below it you know i think i think that's so thematically relevant and it, it just works so well and in, in terms of just the integration conversation that it's hard to ignore that right um yeah but yeah maybe not maybe not to the level i maybe i would say that's an easy fourth and then neverland and monstro and kh1 are just behind space paranoids and two yeah i man if i was off the top of my head neverland and kh1 uh is would probably be higher than Monstro for me, I think. Yeah. Just kind of, of where it comes up in the the story, 
makes it a little bit more impactful. Sure, you know? yeah. I mean, it's like, like the, the it's a pre-show. Yeah. So much higher, and it does feel like we're getting to the end game. Then, and you know, this is kind of the goodbye to the to the good vibes of the Disney World. It's like it's getting kind of serious now. You know? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, the beef is 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 simmering by the time uh, Neverland comes around, and in Monstro, there's still something kind of ambiguous of of where. Riku is going to be with Sora by the end of the game. Right. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which, you know, maybe that actually uh, makes it better. You know, yeah. it's it's hard for me to say. I, I hadn't really compared the two truthfully in mm -hmm. that way. And I don't know. I mean, I put a lot of stock in like how the worlds integrate, but like into the to the overall uh, to the overall universe. I probably put more stock into that than anything else in the the Disney worlds, but like, I don't know. I think there's a a quickness to the monstro stuff. It's it's a pretty, it's it's a little slight, you know. Yeah. Like it's half the time of some of the other ones. Sure. I mean, it packs a lot of good stuff in there, but like, I don't know. I I prefer to spend a little bit more time and have a more diverse landscape, or you know, something yeah. like that. Uh. You know, it is kind of like very similar rooms uh, stylistically over and over again. So yeah. th that's kind of where I dock at points. But uh, as far as the story stuff is concerned, and, and even things like, as she mentioned about a uh, high jump and stuff like that, it does kind of reframe a lot of the gameplay techniques that you're working with throughout the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and then, I mean, the, the number one point, even beyond the Riku stuff, I think the most interesting thing about monstro is the framing the apocalypse you know, oh yeah i mean the jiminy stuff yeah it's the best part of all of cage one yeah. anytime that there's be puppies or you know whatever yeah the contextualization of the apocalypse through this world like is 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 so good i mean if we're just talking like like how good is this world on on the basis of like representing itself as like a kh1 world like it's hard to beat that you know because you don't feel it as intimately in a world like wonderland or deep jungle or agraba you know um yeah where this like it, you constantly are reminded of the reality of the ongoing situation also keynote unfortunately this is uh we're further ahead on this file so geppetto is safe and sound in traverse town right now so <laughs> it's just the boys and monstro at the moment just the squad i think uh i think uh the, the uh, <laughs> interestingly enough it was the the very small story for me that mm. kind of turned me on to monstro even more yeah. than i already was uh because like when i was writing it there were a lot of details that like happened before the the destiny islands part of kh1 that like i had to mention monstro to kind of set up what was coming you know and like what was happening in the overall world it kind of became a little microcosm a little experiment for for everything else that was was going on in the uh in the universe there yeah um so it's it's impact became more clear to me uh when i kind of had to lay everything out it's like man a, a lot of what gets referenced about what's going wrong in the universe here is is framed through the monstro characters is through the pinocchio characters you know yeah absolutely like monstro gets mentioned before sora and riku race in that you know like yeah right right in that in that, that document you can't say for every uh yeah in the dock in the yeah. dock gotcha a very small story yeah you, you're gonna have to like cook us up with a link so that people can see that and know what you're talking about when you reference it you know yeah, I because you're referencing I need too to often do a to not have to. Job of selling this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lil Fuzzy Sheep, thanks for the follow there. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, the the Carly Monster take is probably uh, on the short list for the bracket. I would say. Uh, you never, yeah, you never hear it. Good. So, um, yeah. all right. Giving Axel a Keyblade in three slash Dream Drop was one of the stupidest things about the game. They just have no idea what to do with him after he died in Cage Two, but they knew how popular he was and how upset people would be if he wasn't in any games following Days. Honestly, his presence overall in 3 is unnecessary outside the Days Trio reunion, and they cheapen his character to be the, quote, funny guy, IMO. Um, I don't necessarily, like, disagree with a lot of that, but I also don't think it's a hot take. I think a lot yeah, of people are saying take. this. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot it's of people... It's been a cold take since it happened. Yeah, like, since 2012. 
Um, I think people have been saying, they've been banging the drum on Axel, they don't know what to do with him, and he shouldn't have a Keyblade. And, like, I agree, like, he does feel aimless. I think they're setting stuff up with him, at, you know, at the end of 3, with, you know, Psyx and Subject X and everything, but, um... He, I mean, he really is, like, the funny, kind of Deadpool-esque fourth wall character in 3. Um, so, you know, I, I've heard this a lot. Um, I, again, I don't disagree with a lot of it, but I just think it's, it's kind of cold, so... Probably yeah. not gonna make it there. Um, no name on that one. Um, let's give, see. Give me one more take, Batty. Okay. Give me one more take. Yeah, we can, we'll shut it down for 10, if that's, if that's all right with you. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, a lot of short ones that aren't gonna... Yeah, I'm just gonna delete some of these. Like Kyrie peaked in cage one. Yes or no doesn't matter. It's it's too short. And it's um, cage cage three is easily the weakest game in the series. Yes, I'm not counting coded. Like okay, trash. Throw that in the trash. Yep. Uh, not even a hot take really. <laughs> like people, Can't you know. Be justified. Move yeah. on. Um, Kyrie's cage two design isn't that good at all. She looks better with short hair. Um, you know, not super interesting. Yeah, um, that that's I don't know. Feels like uh, <laughs> not a great place to go. Yeah. Um, BBS has the worst gameplay out of all the games available on home console. Okay, no justification. Delete. Sorry. Um, Roxas. Hey, that one was mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Roxas should have stayed dead, and Ventus should have had a different design. Bringing Roxas or someone who looks like him back for constant fan service really diminishes the emotional impact of his death in Cage Two, in my opinion. I mean, this is a take from, like, 2010, you know? Right. Like, uh, and I don't know if it's really even that hot from when, it, you know, like, if we're comparing it to, like, what things, what people were saying at that time period, I, I feel like people agreed that, like, Ventus should have looked different than Roxas, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm not super interested in that one. Um, let's see. Scold is Ava, and there's proof. That would be PJ's take, I can tell. I'll delete that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Goodbye. Dream Drop Distance Flow Motion may break any sort of platforming challenge in the game, but it's really fun to use and abuse, especially in worlds like Prankster's Paradise or La Cite des Cloches, which have lots of corridors that you can just bounce between the walls in. I don't think that's a hot take. I think everybody thinks that. That's not me. I think everyone loves flow motion. You know? Maybe you just want to start calling it the City of Bells. Yeah, I think I will. La Cite des Cloches! Um... <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's cold though. All right, here's one when it's credited. Practical Silver has uh, done uh, pr Platinum Presto fan art before. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this is the hottest take, but I personally think that Aqua is the weakest character out of the TVA trio, and possibly even out of all the Keyblade wielders. Her entire arc in BBS was to spy on Terra and try and get Ventus back, which is a little disappointing because she didn't really have a goal of her own. It felt like she really only had anything providing towards her own character whenever she ran into her friends, and her friends already had significantly more character than she had, with Terra's fall to darkness and Ventus's fall to night-night mode. <laughs> She was uh, pretty good in 0 0.2 and did a little okay in 3. I'm hoping in the future she has something more to do that really shows us what drives her and who she really is besides Tara's wife and Ven's mom because she has potential. Maybe a game of her own. Um, I think this is a pretty hot take. Like I feel like the, the conventional take is Ven being the weakest of the of the Keyblade wielders or just of that trio. Um, I think it's Tara being the weakest, right? Yeah, well, I think I, I think it's less so weakest and more so like people don't personally like him as much as the other two. Like, yeah. I I don't really see people saying, "Oh, Terra's story is less interesting than Ven's or Aqua's." I mean, I don't really see that very often. Um, I don't know what this. I I think it's a hot take. Um, I don't know if I agree. I think a lot of the entry with Aqua has to do with the sacrifice that she made and all the time that she spent, and a lot of that is forward-looking stuff. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I think uh, I think Aqua has the highest potential out of the other out of those three moving forward, um, just based on all of the trauma that she. I mean, they all endured trauma, right? And you know, Ven maybe has more story significance, well, with the Union Cross angle, um, but I don't know. Like this is on the short list for me. I would say, like, I agree that like. Her own goals are not very well defined. Um, not that Ven's goal is very interesting in BBS. Like for most of it, it's literally just him trying to catch up to Terra because they're friends, and we're told that they're friends because they say they're friends. You know, like uh, the mm -hmm. the early game of BBS is not super strong in terms of setting up the character relationships, if you ask me. Um, 
and then Ven's, like, just trying to make friends with people he meets, and then it's, like, Keyblade stuff in the last hour, Kyblade, rather. Um, you know, I, I think Terra is far and away the most interesting arc of the trio. Um, Definitely. And some people say he's just, like, a blander Riku. Um, I don't really co-sign that. I mean, he really, he's more like Anakin, if you want to compare him to, uh, to anybody else, right? You would say yes. he's, he's doing the Anakin arc. Um, yep. I don't know, I'll put this on the short list for Practically Silver. Do you have anything else to say about that one? Uh, always the most interesting thing with Aqua to me is, uh, she's the indoctrinated character of the series. She's the most, uh, oh, yeah. she's the most brainwashed she's a of the characters. Yeah. I mean, Cage uh, 2 Sora yeah. for sure is up there, I would say. But, like, I mean, he, uh, the thing with Aqua. Yeah. Is that, like, she's trained her her whole life and you know kind of <laughs> does exactly what dad says you know yeah you're right that's true and it's like it, it, she kind of learns throughout her journey uh that a lot of what she was taught was a bunch of horseshit yeah and you know there's actual like you know struggle in the world and everything like that and you know, it's not always as simple as just, like, shutting it out. I mean, sometimes you can't control how you feel and stuff like that, you know? You can't just constantly be stoic. I mean, I think that's always kind of been the most interesting thing with her. And, I mean, she is tyrannical in her way <laughs> the same way that Ericus is. I yeah. mean, they you can't see beyond, you know, the one perspective. Right. They're, uh, <laughs> they're not terribly depthy as... A wise man once said. True, yeah. Kino says she uh, literally licks the Grand Councilwoman's boots on screen. Yeah, <laughs> she's a cop, man. Yeah, she's, she's a, a she's a cop. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been deleting a lot of takes as you were talking. By the way, I've just been like, that's not going. Oh, so you in. haven't even been paying attention. No, I've been I've been listening, but I've also been you multitasking. Bitch, fuck you. <laughs> you bitch, fuck you. Um, is that the last one? Is that the last one you want to ha uh, handle today, Kiwi? Uh. Yes, and also uh, my my last point on the Aqua thing yeah. is that yeah, it's unfortunate that like the de facto strongest lead woman in the series is like her entire thing uh, driving her forward is is uh, chasing after the boys in her way. Uh, yeah. She's always led forward by what the boys are well, up to and <clears throat> what goes wrong for them ends up <laughs> making leading to her sacrifice it's uh yeah. that's unfortunate i've uh yeah i've seen my my patrons earlier today were talking in the in our discord channel that uh kingdom hearts yet is yet is yet to really have a character a female character that is not either a damsel or a mom or a mommy as as frosty put it um mm -hmm. and it really is kind of true like aqua is just momming terra and vent like that's her whole thing you know unfortunately um and then most other female characters that aren't villains are typically mommies like mother gothel ursula um lady tremaine um you know maleficent you know so yeah, it's mommies, like I yeah sure. <laughs> so um it's something that the series has to work on for sure uh it's just kind of a weak point it's, it's always been a weak point unfortunately but and i think they're they're building up to it i mean we've we've been saying they've been building up to it for years now but hopefully eventually it'll be true so um, I guess Yuffie's neither, right? Yuffie and Tifa, they are neither damsels well, nor mommies, but they're not Cage uh, original characters. I mean, I know I was mentioning Disney people as well, but you know. Guess it. Uh, guess it depends on what you mean by mommy. Yeah, I guess so. I guess it depends. <laughs> Is that where we're gonna end on the Aqua one? I kind of. Yeah. I want to read a funny one really quick, and then we'll be done. Do it. The Way to Dawn yeah. is an ugly keyblade that is easily outclassed by Braveheart in terms of design because it's busy and clashes with itself. The angel and bat wings are cool, but in the end, it tries too hard and falls flat. It's the Shadow the Hedgehog of keyblades <laughs> from Telephone 04. I don't know. I'd rather look at The Way to Dawn. Like, yeah, it's trying really hard and it's busy and it clashes with itself, but so is Kingdom Hearts, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Braveheart is boring, and that's not Kingdom Hearts at all. Braveheart's bad, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It's definitely a hot take, though, but I'm not sure if I buy it at all. Yeah. So, I think part of the exercise is, like, am I being convinced of anything new, you know? 
I think that has to be part of it. It has to be hot, and you have to at least, like, move the needle a bit for me. And that doesn't move the needle. Um, so, but it was funny. I People like are booing. There's a lot of booing yeah, going on. They, yeah, they're booing the take, I think. They're not booing us. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Braveheart sucks. <laughs> All right. That was fun. That was a good couple of takes in there. We, we, we found some gold in them, their hills, right? Yes. So, all right. I'm happy with that. Um, I guess we're going to shut it down, and we'll be back on Thursday at 6 for some Zigbar trivia and some more Dream Drop, I guess. Uh, this is a longer one because of the hot takes, but, you know, it was fun. I was I was feeling the energy. Um, anything you want to plug, Kiwi? Can we get the, the very small story anywhere? Any stores near us? Or what's the plan? I'm putting you uh, on the spot. Yeah. Go to your uh, go to your local Barnes and Noble for the two hundred and eighty-one page uh, a very small story. It is anything but a very small story. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Kiwi has chronicled the entire timeline of the series up to this point, and in a document called a very small story that I would really like for him to make publicly available to literally anybody besides the two of us. So it is quite fun. It yeah. is. Uh, it's a good time. I think. I yeah. think. Uh, I think it's pretty enjoyable. It's very it was a it's very pretty, impressive undertaking. It's a surprisingly quick read too. It will not consume your life. That's yeah. nice. And you can like control F anything if you want if you're looking for anything in specific, you know. It um, is a good way to just like get a single character story. Like if you just want the Kyrie story, you can just Yeah. You know, search for her name and then skip around and it's not it fan fiction, by the way. I think people might have that conflated. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a documentarian sort of approach to uh, covering the timeline in the series. So, yes, yeah. it is. Uh, it is an encyclopedia. Yeah. Yes. There you go. All right, folks. Well, you know where to find me: Discord, Patreon, Twitter. Those are all my links. We'll be back at 6 p.m. on Thursday for Zigbar trivia, more Dream Drop, and whatever else happens to happen after that. You know, it's 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 chaos. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, say goodbye to the people, Kiwi. Bye, everyone. Thanks for dealing. And we will see y'all on Thursday, all right? Peace out. Be safe, be kind.